Yes, it is I, your humble host, Bill Hatch the third, coming to you live from the palatial home studios of Bald Spot Productions here in the beautiful city of Santa Ana, California. Joining me as per the usual in studio is my friend, my brother in Christ, the disembodied and sleepy voice of Rudy. Everybody, I love you all. Welcome, 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 welcome. And joining us from a more than acceptable safe social distance is my father, Chaplain Bill Hatch. How you doing, Pop? Doing very well. Good, e good day, my fellow Bible Inquisitors. <laughs> Caught me on the time frame for our recording session, right? Yep. But anyway, doing well here in Poplar Bluff, Missouri. Yes, and bathed in natural light. <laughs> yeah, there's quite a bit, quite a few clouds out this way, so I don't know how much natural light will seep through. I still have a ceiling light on. Ah, uh, okay. Um, yeah, I've got a light on too, but uh, but we've got some natural light coming in through the window. And this is another episode of YWL Online's Anything Can Happen Saturday, where we're going to be continuing our journey through the through Dr. John Barnett's anyway. 52 greatest chapters of the Bible, Bible, Bible. And this week we're going to be going through Galatians 1 and 2, which isn't a chapter, but two chapters. So uh, so once again, he's pulled a fast one on us <laughs> that we had much preparation time for. But before Indeed. we get through all of this material, I think we have time for a Rudy Minute. What do you think? Absolutely. My Rudy Minute is always have God in the mind. Try to pray for everybody as much as you can. Do what you can if you can feel it. And that's good because I try to pray all day or I see something in prayer or I talk to God all the time. Like, hey, God. And you know, the thing is, I go, hey, you know what, God? And I go, hey, uh, God knows everything. So I don't know why I say that all the time. But remember, open your heart for God because you can feel that beautiful warmness and the blessings and the happiness that he does give. Life is life. You're going to always have problems. There's always going to be things, but at least you know that God is on your side and you can talk to him anytime you want. And he can bless you because he is your friend. He is your, your God. He is your love. So please spread the love and spread the word. Waka, waka, waka with the Lord. Indeed. Um, yeah, uh, in fact, uh, I went uh, to church this morning for a prayer meeting uh, myself. We don't spend enough time in prayer, uh, I don't think. Uh, I think we spend little enough time in the Bible and probably less time in prayer. But uh, um, but we need to increase those things. But, uh, um, you know, because spending time with God, both by reading the Bible and in prayer and in worship, are uh, in, in are good things to do um, because God likes them, and uh, even though He knows everything, He does like to hear from us from time to time. And uh, of course, uh, Paul tells us to be in prayer constantly. So uh, um, you know, so always have a, an open attitude of of prayer and open communication with God. What do you think? I agree fully. I liked the way in C.S. Lewis's first of the Chronicle of Narnia books. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, the producer is coming here and it's walking okay. and clicking on the table. So anyway, <laughs> uh, in C.S. Lewis's book, at one point, the children uh, are sent by Aslan to go pluck an apple that's minor but anyway they don't get there in the first day and they stop at night and they don't have any food with them and one of the children said uh you know you would have thought he would have aslan meaning god would have sent food with us and the flying talking horse at the time said I suppose, but you didn't ask him, and I think maybe he likes to be asked once in a while. I think that's a real <laughs> direct reference to prayer and saying, yeah, yeah, even though we know things and God knows everything, we still should be communicating with him regularly. 
Yeah. Yes, indeed. Um, we should be, and that that sounds very C.S. Lewis. Um, hold on a second. Let's see. What was what was his name? Hold on. I'm going to find something um, because you reminded me of it. Uh, there is on YouTube a uh, um, a one man a video of an old an old video of a one man show uh, from the point of view of C.S. Lewis. Um, let's see. Hold on. Was <laughs> one man show, and it was really good. I mean, it was moving. Um, let's see, there it is My Life's Journey. Um, which, uh, let's see, um, was University of California Television, and uh, um, the uh, the actor playing uh, C.S. Lewis was David Payne. And uh, um, we've actually watched it a couple of times. It's so good. Um, you really should uh, find it. David Payne, My Life's Journey. But, uh, um, but yeah, I thought okay. uh, thought that might be worth uh, worth spreading the word on. Um, but yeah, he's very very faithful to his uh, to the Christian uh, aspects of uh, of C.S. Lewis. Of the book. And uh, um, no, he doesn't really talk about any of the individual books. Um, he talks about his life and and uh, um, living with his brother and their nicknames for each other and and uh, um, and then he talks about his wife and uh, um, and her children and and uh, okay. how all that uh, played out and uh, um, yeah it was yeah it's it's well, worth watching. We need to get away from that. We do. We do. That was so, definitely oh a, a rabbit trail, as you often put it. <laughs> And uh, but All yes, right. Galatians one and two. Let me can I do a little bit of background? Yes, please. Uh, Galatians may actually the area of Galatia may actually indicate an invasion of the Gauls uh, in the northern part of okay what we call Galatians mm -hmm. about 287 BC I did not I came across that this week and it just sort of wow we have Gauls in English history mm -hmm. but not uh, I hadn't realized that it might be actually this as well uh, only a possibility that they were a group that came down in 287 BC but that might be the reference. It also huh. might be something totally lost to us in history. But there's a slim chance that it is. I also want to let you know that Galatians may very well be the first letter of Paul's written to any group of people. Okay. It's not for sure. And if it, it could be as early as 49 AD. And or it could be as late as 55 AD. Uh, I found that in two different parts of the study from one study Bible, and that's what I want to get at, mm -hmm. is that when you're looking at study Bibles, they are usually compilations. Several people gathering together and giving their ideas mm -hmm. that go into each of the books of the Bible that are at the front of them in the study Bibles. Uh so, you know, it's possible that it could have been 49 A.D. or 55 A.D. for the time frame. Right. But in the study Bible, they present both views in different places. And so it's it's fun to look at those kinds of things. And it is helpful to be able to say, remembering that everybody gets their own understanding by reading the scriptures. And so... We have that, and we try to work with it in a daily routine. Uh, but that's what, those are a couple of things. I wrote down a whole lot more, honest. But I'm not going to go through it all unless I reference back to it. Right. So, with that, Bill, would you like to start with Galatians? Yes, let us start with Galatians. I mean, you do your part <laughs> of starting. Okay, Um Let's see. How do we want to do it? Do we want to do it uh, chunk by chunk, or uh, or stick with verse by verse? 
because chapter one's pretty short. It is rather short, yes. And I have a lot of notes. Okay. And I don't want to use them all either. <laughs> I really want to say that openly. I don't want to use all of them. Right. Because of what's going on. Uh, so you can start or I can. I will. Um, I'll, I'll have, be happy to start. We start with the introduction. Uh, Paul, an apostle, not commissioned and sent from men nor through the agency of man, but through Christ Jesus, the Messiah, and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, this is a very normal, uh, normal kind of intro for Paul. Tells us he's not alone, um, and uh, um, and kind of preps us for uh, for some of the stuff that he's going to be getting into um, with the uh, with the Judaizers. Um, let's see. Continuing on to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace, inner calm and spiritual well-being from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave Himself as a sacrifice to atone for our sins to save and sanctify us so that he might rescue us from this present evil age in accordance with the will and purpose and plan of our God and Father. To him be ascribed all the glory through the ages of ages. Amen. Mine finishes it forever and ever. Amen. Okay. Uh, Bill, while I agree that it is a general type sounding opening for Paul, as we'll see with the very next verse, is that it's actually one of the shortest yes. greetings that he ever extends very uh, true. because of that fifth verse. The fifth verse, sorry, it's the sixth verse. Little numbers in the print, <laughs> that's all. Yeah. It says, I'm amazed that you're so quickly turning away from him who called you, you by the grace of Christ and the and are turning to a different gospel. Ooh. Paul is throwing up a very quick defense for what's going on in Galatia. And the and the reason being is, is that people are challenging his apostleship. Right. And so he's really, you know, getting into it quickly. Paul's on the defensive when he's writing Galatians. There are people going in, primarily the Judaizers, mm -hmm. uh, who want everybody, all the men, that is, to be circumcised. Right. Because they want them all to follow Jewish laws, not just the grace that comes through G from God through Jesus, right. especially and he's circumcision. Go ahead, especially the circumcision. <laughs> yeah, especially. Um, and we'll see here very directly about a curse that that he puts on them, and it's only one of two that are terrible. Let's see, origin of the apostleship. Yes, his apostolic origin. And I do want to get into that a little bit, but it has to do with verse 7 and 8. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are troubling you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. And it goes on, uh, ending verse 8, it says, a curse be on him, whoever that person or those people are, he wants them literally cursed. Yeah. He he's putting up a defense that says, How ridiculous to think that I would change my gospel of Jesus, or even that an angel might come and do it. I don't want to get into the differences of the fallen angels become demons, and they're not easily recognized right. as angels. Yes, Satan can make himself look like an angel. Mm -hmm. So we do have to be careful of that one. But in general, we're not talking about, you know, angels coming down and changing the gospel of Jesus. 
Paul's using extreme examples here uh, that he absolutely doesn't want people to think that the gospel will ever change. Right. And I believe that faithfully after 2000 years, it hasn't. But we do have hints in biblical reference that Paul actually wrote a gospel of the life of Jesus mm -hmm. on earth. But that gospel has been literally rewritten by others. Mm -hmm. And it was done very early and it was totally distorted uh, and used for a while trying to say, well, this is what the life of Christ was really, not Matthew, what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John say. Right. So it was still around when the Bible was being compiled. And the compilers just looked at it and they could tell that it had been rewritten. And they said, no, this isn't in keeping with the, with the other gospels of the life of Jesus. Right. And they excluded it. Yep. So Paul might be talking about the fact that that gospel that he wrote is already been distorted. Yeah. And they might have been carrying this paperwork parchment around and saying, look, this is a, you know, this is the gospel according to Paul. And it's what we should be doing. And they also were, you know, requiring other written Jewish laws that were literally three, 2000 years old at that point. Mm -hmm. Meaning the laws of Moses. So it's actually 2,500 ish. Yep. Uh, still, we have that there, and Paul doesn't want them troubled by these false teachings. Right. Um, I also want to point out that Paul is using first person plural in this. He's not, he, he is using his normal humility and spreading, uh, and spreading it around. Um, you know, uh, that, uh, um, he doesn't just mean himself. He means himself and those people who are around him, those who have followed him and studied under him, and uh, um, you know, and and uh, you know, and so he's he's keeping that there to uh, um, well, to just like I said, to kind of show both his humility and also his reach at the same time. Sure. Um, so uh, so anyway. Mm -hmm. But yeah, my verse eight ends with let him be condemned to destruction. <laughs> I know I wrote something down more on how difficult, at least I thought I had, and now I don't see it, so maybe not. Uh, Paul wanted anybody who was distorting the gospel to be cursed. Right. We're talking about Judaizers who want men to be circumcised, just like the laws of Moses, which is not just a cringe factor, it was a health factor mm -hmm. not to do such things when people were that old. Yeah. Uh, we've discussed in other programs where it's been shown that male children actually have their highest vitamin E count when they're eight days old. Yeah which is when they're to be circumcised, the Old Testament and vitamin E is helpful for recovery uh, and healing. So, you know, that the Bible gives good reasons for doing circumcision then, uh, but not for adults like these Judaizers are wanting. Paul curses the folks here, but not like he does elsewhere, because at another point in Paul's writings, he says, nah, don't, you know, let let them emasculate themselves. Right. Let them become eunuchs. Let, let them go all the way. Uh, <laughs> which is definitely, uh, you know, a whole lot more. Uh, it's a very difficult curse no matter what. Yeah. Uh, but here he's saying they should be cursed for even suggesting such a thing. Right. And like I said, this, the first two chapters of Galatians definitely focus on Paul's justifying not just his apostleship, but what he's been teaching. 
And so we have this, may they be cursed for doing such terrible things. Uh, Paul has other places in the in his writings where he is telling people not to fight and, and to get along and uh, the fact that some have resigned themselves to the ways of Satan, but he's not really passing judgment on others. But on this one, it sure sounds like he is so adamant against adding the laws of Moses onto the grace of Jesus that he's going through this. And I agree, of course, that we shouldn't add those laws. If there are things right. that we wish to say, oh, that was in the law, and I happen to want to follow that, I'm thinking of dietary rules in particular. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we can do that as a living choice, but not as a spiritual necessity. Right. Yeah, I said it right. Spiritual yeah, you necessity. said it right. Spiritual necessity. So we have that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Paul, uh, Paul talks, uh, shoot, I don't remember where, uh, but he said he talks about not um, not oppressing people for making those choices. Um, the one where he's like, if you don't eat meat, don't say to the person who eats meat that they're doing wrong. Don't don't bad mouth them for that or vice versa. Mm -hmm. Oops. All right. Okay, and, and the curse turn off is the... repeated again yeah. at the end of verse 9, uh, because he really is adamant about people mm -hmm. should not be trying to change the good news of Jesus. Right. And so we have that. Do you have anything else on any of the first nine you want to bring up, Bill? Um, no. Uh, no, we've talked about uh, everything I had. Okay, I want to get into 10 because the timing, I think, is very relevant for this week in verse 10. Mm -hmm. uh, he says, for am I now trying to persuade people or God, or am I striving to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. I want to especially point that out because this Tuesday, you all will be voting. Mm -hmm. I hope and pray. Uh, I won't be because I already have. Right. We're leaving out of town after the show today, and we're going to be not available to vote on Tuesday. So we already did. And I really do encourage everyone to vote. And I want you to be pleasing to God, just like we're told here in Galatians, everything we do should be an attempt to please God. Yes. So please, when you go vote, or even before you go vote, first study the candidates and the issues. Mm -hmm. And second of all, pray about it yeah. all before you vote. And I don't just mean wait until Tuesday morning. Uh, mm -hmm. That gets difficult with the amendments. Right. I think it gets difficult with some of the people. And for goodness sake, don't just vote party lines. Right. Look at the substance of what they're saying. Because you may uh, you may find that a particular person in the party line has attitudes and beliefs that are contrary to biblical truth. Yes, you know, and some of them have beliefs that are contrary to the platform of the parties. Yes, that's true. Now that's rare, right? But, but yeah, don't. Okay, I'll just yeah. say it because I am not a Democrat, and I will never claim to be a Democrat mm -hmm. because they have a party platform that legalizes abortion for any reason. Or none. And I do not believe that should ever have been the case. Right. Uh, the Bible talks about, of course, having sex in the first place. Uh, and therefore, there should only be a union of a man and a woman to have children together. And not just any man and woman having sex outside of marriage. And then, oops, I'm pregnant. I'm going to go get an abortion now. Uh-uh. No. That's a human life. 
And so I never will go on a democratic uh, platform. Right. In my, I just won't. Yeah. That's all there is to it. But the idea of voting, that's pleasing God. We should vote to please God, not just people. Yeah. And vote based on, you know, and, and when you're looking at candidates, look at how they actually express their stated beliefs. If they say one mm -hmm. thing and do another, or if they act in a certain way that uh, uh, that if you acted that way in church, you'd probably get uh, get stoned. Um, maybe you shouldn't be voting for that guy or woman. Yeah. Or gal. Or ga guy or gal. <laughs> so, but uh, we won't tell you how to vote. Just go out and uh, and vote uh, with your heart and your mind, and uh, um, and the and your Bible. And everything should be okay. Mm -hmm. um, moving on. Moving on. Do you have things for eleven and twelve? Uh, let's see. Um, no, nothing. Uh, nothing important. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, just that. Uh, once again, we're we're having a little bit of a reference to. Uh, um, to his time uh, studying uh, the Bible with direct uh, revelation from uh, from God, uh, from Jesus, um, you know, uh, when he after his conversion and uh, and healing, that uh, um, yeah, an important and not really very well recorded time. Yeah, it's not very well recorded, and I can relate a little bit, both here and again in chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, but I don't want to skip that far forward. <laughs> but here in 11, he's talking about the gospel preached by me. That means Paul, the gospel, the good news that he talked with the Galatians on his very first missionary journey. Uh, okay, he's talking about that. And then he goes down, it came by revelation of Jesus Christ, which is the end of verse 12 no one can verify that revelation of him when he received when he was knocked to the ground blinded right. for three days and jesus spoke to him and called him to the ministry right there's no one that can verify it there's some of the witnesses who were with him thought they heard a voice, but they couldn't tell if it was thundering. Mm -hmm. So there's no verification for Paul. I can relate to that because I received a one word revelation from God to be a chaplain. I can't prove that. I go forward with it by faith. What I think I can uh, substantiate a little bit is the fact that many have accepted Jesus as Savior and Lord mm -hmm. through the work that the mm -hmm. Holy Spirit led me to as a chaplain. But there's no verification for me. Paul is justifying his saying, it was a revelation from Jesus himself. Right. And that's... But there's no proof to it. Right, and, uh, and he's and, trying to he's trying to contrast himself to the Judaizers, um, who mostly didn't stu directly study the scriptures, but instead studied a rabbi under a rabbi who told them yeah. the scriptures, um, much yes. like uh, much like in Catholic churches, how they don't have Bibles in the pews, um, they're they're relying on some on a human being to give them the gospel. Yeah. And it's very important for us to realize that God works in mysterious ways. I mean, Paul had to have a blinding road experience, and I don't want that for any of our listeners. Right. Um, Except for that guy is... over there. That one. Sorry. <laughs> but I'm just teasing. Uh, but he's defending again. So I say there's a lot of defense in here, mm -hmm. and he's putting out the fact, okay, yeah, the revelation was by Jesus, not by any human forms, not by the other apostles, not by 
uh, certainly not by any ancient teachings of Moses, even though he was brought up and trained well. Yep. That comes up here in Galatians. But he received the gospel message. And it took that blinding road experience. And we should be grateful because his ministry was to go to the Gentiles. Right. Of which the Galatians are part of. Okay. Um, I mean, I think it's really good to see Paul explaining some of it in verse. Oh, come on, Bill. I can't read the numbers even with the magnifying glass. At the end of 16 and 17, it says, I did not immediately consult with anyone. I did not go up to Jerusalem to those who had become apostles before me. Instead, I went to Arabia and came back to Damascus. Mm -hmm. It's fun to see. I Interesting and fun for me because I do like history. Yeah. And to see that Paul didn't just get his blinding road experience and then go out and start preaching. Mm -hmm. He did self-study for a lot of years. And we do not know of all the individuals who uh, might have worked with him during that time of his travels. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're told in the next verse that after three years he went to Jerusalem. And we have to go back into Acts to find out that they rejected him because they feared him at first. Uh, it was only because of Barnabas taking him in. Right. Uh, that he was accepted, uh, but very cautiously. <laughs> yeah. And even after that, it wasn't, okay, hop on the bandwagon and go. He still had to have time for more self-study and of the scriptures and to be able to find out that Jesus really is exactly who he said, the Son of God. Mm -hmm. And Barnabas has to go find him and take him to Antioch. And they literally, you know, establish a strong church there. Yes, there had been believers. That's why Barnabas was sent down in the first place. But he gets Paul and they establish that church. And Antioch comes, becomes what Jerusalem should have become. And that is the jumping off point for all missionaries. But that's a judgmental call, so I'm not going there too much. Uh, we're told that certainly Paul did have three days with Cephas. That's Peter. Mm -hmm. um, that was all part of verse 18. Bill, have I skipped over anything that you'd like to cover? 15 days. Um, just the, 15 days. Yeah, yes, not, not, Sorry. not three, yeah. <clears throat> um, just that there's a lot of uh, a lot of Greek in here that's very forceful. Um, Paul's not just saying, "Hey, you know, this is." He's not being airy fairy about this. He's he's being forceful. Um, like uh, in verse uh, fourteen, the uh, the Greek word for advancing means to chop ahead. Um, and uh, basically, Paul is uh, is using this phraseology to uh, to talk about, you know, to basically tell them, hey, these Jewish Christians, these Judaizers, are are hindering the 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 development, the growth of the gospel and the development of your Christianity, and he's cutting sure. them down to size. Yes, he, he is. is. You know, Paul is not one to mince words. Well, that's not entirely true. He does, he does do, Paul has two things that really attract me to his writings. And one is the forcefulness with which he writes on occasion. And just like the, the being down to the nitty gritty, the brass knuckles and all that, when it comes to defending the gospel, um, verbally, that is. And, uh, and then, of course, his sarcasm. Um, which is so, which can really be fun to, uh, to watch when you, uh, when you realize that's what he's doing. Um, you know, that, and that's one of the reasons why I don't take these interpret the Bible literally 
people very seriously because you can't take Paul serious literally all the time because sometimes he's being sarcastic. And that's not meant to be taken literally. <laughs> right. There are definitely some very good points, though. And I skipped totally past verse 15 because mm -hmm. Paul was so able to weave things from the present and connecting them with the Old Testament. In verse 15, he alludes to the prophet Jeremiah mm -hmm. when Paul declares that from my mother's womb, God set me apart. Right. And that is true for all of us. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's hard to, to conceptualize. I admit it. But God knows what we are all going to be doing. And God, according to Paul, God set him apart before he was born. But Paul, from the time he was born to the time he got that Damascus Road experience, was not right. jumping on the Christian bandwagon. He had to progress. That's true for all of us. God knows that we are going to be part of his ever-loving kingdom from even before we we're born, and it's hard to see and understand. But I firmly believe that God knows what decisions we make. It's not that he's made the decision for us, but he already knows. Right. And Paul is saying that, hey, this really was set long before. And if I had been paying attention, I would have never agreed to the stoning of Stephen. Right. Uh, as an example, for sure. But we can't forget that Paul even claims that Jeremiah link of God knows all of us from the time we're formed in our mom's wombs. Oh. All right. Paul in this section, um, yeah, Paul in this section also claims that he did see James, the brother, half-brother of Jesus. Uh, and he firmly says to defend himself, I'm not lying to you about all this. Right. Um, I, I like the my, reference. That, my translation in, uh, in verse 20 um, I like I like the way he states it. I assure you, as if I were standing before God, that I am not lying. Very yeah. careful not to not to use something like "I swear to God." Yeah, I swear to God, Mister Kata. <laughs> but uh, um, but oh, yeah, he, but, stay stay away. <laughs> no, no, that's the dude with the laugh, uh, Vinny Bobarino. Okay. Yeah. Oops. Um, again, Paul ends what we have, chapter one, but he ends this thought of idea here, is that he was recognized as being an apostle, even though it was a recognition he would like not to have. And that is the people said, he who formerly persecuted us now preached this is the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. Right. That's what our object should be in a, on a daily basis is glorifying God always. Always and, and forever. And so he says that, yeah. They used to add that part on there about me being the one who tried to destroy things. And then I got converted, but I don't care because they're glorifying God. Yep. Because of that conversion. So he's there and he's definitely going forward with it. You have anything on those last couple in chapter one, Bill? Uh, no, nothing, uh, nothing I've written down. Okay. Um, yeah, just a lot of a lot of its uh, information about where he went and when he spent time and what was going up uh, up that way, um, and different descriptions of, of that kind of thing. So yeah, 
nothing we need to worry about. And with verse one of chapter two, we see that 14 years between the time of his conversion mm -hmm. and when he literally went up to Jerusalem and Barnabas is the one who took him in, I think anyway. Uh, nope, see, I goofed that up. And Titus. Because 14 years is before the missionary journey, I think. We don't know for sure. Uh, but we have Paul, Barnabas, and even Titus uh, going along with them. They went up uh, according to a revelation and presented to them the gospel meaning to the council. So this is the first council. Peter and John and, and the half-brother of Jesus with, James. With the apostles who were still there. Yep. And with James, the half-brother of Jesus. Right. Remember, uh, James, the half-brother of Jesus, is not James the apostle. Right. Not the son of thunder. he's already been martyred. Right. To say the least. Yeah. But Paul is still justifying himself. You know, try to say, these were the steps. This is what happened. This is how I've been supported by uh, leadership. So it's not like he's a satellite individual. Uh, I can only think of extreme individuals in modern history like that who have led people astray. I know that there are still others where that's happening. Uh, but to be able to say he did this and the reason why I believe it's got to be the earlier writing is it talks about Titus who is not coerced or forced to be circumcised. Right. Even though he was a Greek. And he's talking about that here in chapter two. But he talked privately with the leadership. Uh, he wasn't that he rolled into Jerusalem and started preaching from the temple steps. Uh, about what he believed he check, was checking with the leadership first, that he wasn't doing it wrong. Uh, but not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. But we have uh, in other letters that the Judaizer group kept growing stronger. Mm -hmm. And later on, Paul goes back to Jerusalem with, I don't know if it was, it was Timothy, Timothy would have been circumcised. No, because Timothy was half Greek. Went, I'm sorry. I think it was Timothy. No, I think it was Timothy. Who was forced to be coerced to be circumcised. Right. To go into and the temple. The Judaizer problem just kept growing, but here, Paul is saying, look, not even Titus had to be circumcised. Right. So wasn't compelled to be circumcised. And so we have these kinds of examples. Uh, I know that, where did I, did I write it down? Yeah. Uh, in verse two, you know, they went up by revelation of God, not human compulsion. It wasn't uh, the leadership in Jerusalem saying, oh, Paul, come up here and justify yourself. God was saying, go to them and show them what you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, um, let's see, I said here in chapter 2, Titus did not need to be circumcised. Later, Paul, by his own writings, had Timothy, see, there it is, uh, circumcised. And finally, to show even more of it, the last time Paul went to Jerusalem, the leadership talked him into paying the temple requirements for vows of some other Christian believers. Mm -hmm. And they were all getting ready. They, they made vows and promises, and they went for a certain amount of time, and then they were supposed to provide a sacrifice. Right. 
Right. This is all found in what Acts 19. Mm -hmm. I think so. And lo and behold, God steps in, in my opinion, because Paul was getting ready to do an Old Testament sacrifice. Yeah. Which would negate, show him negating the official last sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Right. And so God intervened and had got him arrested because God didn't want Paul committing any sacrifices after Jesus had. Well, the Judaizer problem kept going. And I really believe in God's wisdom. That's why the destruction of the temple had to take place didn't have to take place in 70 AD. In my opinion, they could have happened back all around 34 AD, when, right after Jesus was uh, crucified. But there had to be time for the Christian church movement to go forward, I guess. But people were still trying to do sacrifices. And I think the faction of Judaizing Christians had to be done away with. Yeah. And the only way to do that was to stop the place of circum of sacrifices. And so the temple was destroyed. Yep. Did I say that well enough though? I think so. <laughs> okay. Uh, and by the way, that's Acts 21. <laughs> oh, okay. Not Acts 19. That's when he's traveling to to Jerusalem for the last time. Ah. Uh, I just really like that particular portion. Yeah. Because I really do believe that God in his wisdom knew that there would be some Christ whoops. Sorry, I'm getting interrupted. I hope I'm still with you. Uh I've lost your video. And I've lost you completely. Well, folks, that's uh, that's interesting. Um, let's uh, there he is. You hung up on us. Sorry, that. <laughs> I'm back. Is that okay? That's great. That's perfect. So we can keep going. We can keep going uninterrupted. Well, hopefully, no longer <laughs> interrupted. Yeah, no longer interrupted. All right. I have. Um, I did want to make sure we didn't skip over verse nine. Good. Okay. Okay. Because this is, this is important. Um, basically, what, uh, what Paul is saying is that these others who are so revered, like Peter and John of the, uh, of the original 12, and James, the half-brother of Jesus, who was now the leader of the Jerusalem church, extended to him and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, which sounds like something you can kind of pass over, but in Middle Eastern tradition, at least at the time, this was a huge deal. This, this is Paul saying, look, the pillars of the community, the people you guys look up to and wish you were, these guys said to me, you're cool. You're, you're good with us. And, uh, and we want you to go out to the, uh, to the, um, to, to the Gentiles and spread the gospel because we think yeah. you're the man. And uh, um, so it's not just uh it's not just a, hey, how you doing uh, kind of uh, kind of thing. The right hand of fellowship is a big deal. Yes. And I, I have notes on nine and eight and nine that are a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And yet the same. Okay. The importance was absolutely there. But what focused me being me uh, is... Keep your ministry in the right focus area mm -hmm. is what came out for me. Okay. The fact that, yes, Paul is saying they recognize me and Barnabas. They gave us the right hand of fellowship. Peter would keep working with the uh, Jewish 
converts mm -hmm. to Christianity. And Paul and Barnabas would go out to the Gentile community, right. keeping their fo ministry focused. Uh, perhaps it's because Paul could have very easily been drugged down into the dreariness of having to continually focus only on Jesus being proved by the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. You know how scholars get, you know, well, let's look at this little jot and tittle, comma and period. Right. Uh, or dot over the eye type thing. Uh, and that would have drugged Paul's ministry down and kept him from going forward and out. Mm -hmm. um, to, the, to the Gentiles to whom the Old Testament wasn't a thing. Um, most uh, most Gentiles then as now don't uh, don't look at the Old Testament very much, right? And uh, we all yeah. should, by the way, yeah. read the whole Bible, not just the there, New Testament. There's a reason the Old Testament's there. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit directed Paul and Barnabas to go out that way. Yep. The Holy Spirit has directed me to be a chaplain, and it's primarily to military. Mm -hmm and veterans, uh, you know, those who were in the military. Uh, and I am not called to be uh, a missionary with foreign languages. I have enough trouble with English. <laughs> so that definitely uh, rings for me. Me, i speak English but good. Also, I have tried and found that I am not a prison minister okay or chaplain even uh i have tried it uh, under compulsion uh while in the military i would have to go and visit guys in prisons and i did some police uh educate you know i wanted to be a policeman like my father and i went to college for that and we took some field trips out to prisons and i just was not comfortable. Mm. I found that I was hindered from doing much of anything uh, when I was out there, other than direct line to the one individual I was to see and was hardly even able to say hello to other people. It I was just that uncomfortable with it. Yeah. And so I wasn't really, you know, going that way. Lord hasn't given me any new insight to that. So uh, I certainly am not making plans to be a prison chaplain anytime in the near future, mm -hmm. unless God really directs it by a revelation again, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but my comfort zone wasn't there. And I wrote down at the end of my notes, yet, because I have to be open to that. Mm -hmm. You know, God could say, Bill, I want you to start being a chaplain to this group of inmates and i'll have to say yes lord i will go yeah but all of us should be that way in our individual focus what does god say we should be doing for his kingdom absolutely and so that jumps out at me from this particular passage in addition to the authorization of paul and barnabas by the other church leaders okay. Bill, I'm almost done with my uh, bigger notes. Do I need to go into smaller ones? Um, well, we've, let's see, I think we've hit most everything, really. I mean, uh, we've got a, we've only got a couple minutes left anyway. Um, basically, the, the rest of this is, well, the, the big chunk, uh, 11 to 14, is about, uh, um, is about Paul uh, opposing Peter. In some of his uh, actions that uh, that have to do with I circumcision, I think it's more like confronting. Confronting, yeah, that's yeah. a that's a much better word. Um, yeah, that he confronted uh, Peter about uh, about the circumcision and and the uh, hypocrisy, um, you know, and what happened, and uh, um, you know that uh, um, that really pushes forward this uh, salvation by faith alone through grace alone. Um, yes, and that's how he finishes the chapter. Right. And it is with a startling statement that, uh, well, I'll read it because it's the very last 
stanza. Okay. If righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. Yep. And I don't ever want to consider such a terrible thing that Christ didn't die for me. Yes, he did. Well, even worse that he died for nothing. Yeah. You know, but personally, yeah. you know, I'm never going to say, well, Jesus didn't die for me because he did. Yep. I faithfully believe that. And it's the grace of God that comes because of that ultimate sacrifice. And him taking all of our sins himself and dragging down to hell and leaving them there when he went up north. <laughs> oh. Sorry, that's a relative directional term, I know. But when he went <laughs> to heaven. Right. But yes, you know, it is absolutely grace that we are saved by, not by any acts that we can possibly do. Right. Because if that had been true. Jesus wouldn't have come down and lived the perfect example, the mm -hmm. sinless life, and then die on the cross for our sins. Yeah. It wouldn't have been necessary if we could have. Yeah. If there was nothing we could do, then if there was anything we could do, then there wouldn't have been any purpose for Jesus to come down. Yeah. So. Now, summation. Yes. Yes, chapters one and two of Galatians are important because it shows us some things about Paul. He felt the need to justify himself. We need to see how his self justification shows us how God was involved with it mm -hmm. because God is involved in our lives, able to bring us to the saving faith of Jesus right. and become heirs of his kingdom. So, yeah, it's a good two chapters instead of one. <laughs> yeah, um, I think part of it, I think he missed part of the importance of it. I think because uh, he, uh, what was it? He, he titled this, uh, um, this one, Justified by Faith, Not Law. I think it's important more because there are definitely better passages, I think, about justification by faith alone. Okay. Um, but this is probably the greatest um, explanation of who Paul was and, uh, and why we should be paying attention to him. Mm. Um, it's and certainly I, I think, uh, how his example of self-justification mm -hmm. Because he's human, just like us, right? And uh, and that we should—that's uh, that's an example we should be prepared to uh, to to follow. Um, you know that we have good. Uh, you know, it's like that. Your your testimony needs to be strong, and uh, um, so that people can understand where you're coming from and why they should listen to you. Absolutely. So, so yeah, so pretty darn good chapter or two. <laughs> yes, it is. And with that, gentle inquisitors, we uh, we invite you once again to join us in this family we call Christianity, and to uh, um, do this uh, not with sacrifice because that's already been taken care of, and not by. Um, not by a magical spell or mystical ceremony. That's not what the sinner's prayer is. The sinner's prayer is merely an alignment tool to get your heart straight with God and, uh, um, and get you looking at the path that you need to take. Um, not, uh, it's not salvation in and of itself, although uh, the Bible does say, declare with your mouth that he is Lord and you will be saved. Um, but, uh, um, but you have to live the life too. There's a big difference between becoming a Christian and being a Christian. Amen. And, uh, and so we invite you to become a Christian today and, uh, and pray that you will be a Christian tomorrow. Um, 
But uh, um, so if you'll uh, all join, because uh, we've all sinned and fallen and continually fallen short of the glory of God. Um, so uh, whether you've been a believer for a second or a century, you should be praying to God for forgiveness and uh, and restoration. And so we invite you to do that with us today. Um, remember, these words are not biblical, are not in the Bible. They are merely based on biblical text and principles. And so you can say them the way that best fits you and your life. You just got to remember that some of this is really, really important stuff to keep in mind as you're being a Christian. Yep. So, uh, um, so follow along and we'll do this together. Dear Lord. Dear Lord. I am a sinner. I am a sinner. Cleanse me of my wickedness. Cleanse me of my wickedness. Teach me to love you with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. Teach me to love you with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. And show me how to love my neighbor as myself. And show me how to love my neighbor as myself. Help me to do the work for the building of your kingdom. Help me to continue doing the work for your kingdom. And guide my steps along the path you would have me take. And continue guiding my steps along that path. Come into my heart and be the Lord and the Savior of my life. Remain in my heart, being my Lord and Savior. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, with that, I welcome you to the family of Christ. And uh, to remember that uh, once you've entered, if you really uh, have changed, then you will want to do things that will please the Lord, just as uh, just as we learned Paul did and uh, his attitude toward that in uh, in today's reading. Um, you know, this is, uh, oh, uh, I mean, it's e going to be easy on you because tomorrow morning is Sunday and uh, all almost all the churches are going to be open. So you can find yourself a Bible-believing church with Bible-believing fellow Christians and learn your next steps. What, uh, what should you do next? And that should be what you're always looking toward, is what, as a Christian, should I be doing next? And, uh, um, and so with that, we invite you to join us in the other shows we have during the course of the week. On Tuesday will be uh, another episode of YWL Online's Totally Approachable Bible Study for All, where we will continue our journey through the Psalter. And uh, we're going to start with Psalm number 74. Was it? Yep. yep. Psalm 74. So go ahead and read 74 through 78. And uh, that should uh, keep you up to date on the conversation. Um, remember, we don't use just one uh, version of the Bible. Uh, I use uh, six um, off and on to uh, check and double check myself. And make sure that I have a good grasp of what the of what the vet passage is saying. Um, I also use commentaries and study Bibles, as does uh, Chaplain Hatch. Um, and so, uh, and so, there are definitely resources out there that will help you better understand what the Bible is talking about. Um, now, uh, let's see. On Thursday, uh, we'll have another episode of YWL Online. No, we'll have another episode of Not Quite After Midnight. That's better. <laughs> That's better. My uh, my tiredness is catching up with me. Um, so we better end this quick. <laughs> Let's see. I'm double checking to see who's going to be on this uh, this week. Last week's episode of uh, Not Quite After Midnight was really good. Um, we had on a musician and an author, and they talked a lot about writing. And, uh, oh, wait, wrong date. And uh, um, and ha and creativity and all that. Um, oh, we'll be having on another uh, two oh two second time guests, uh, Amy Romine, who uh, um, uh, let's see is uh, um, a business coach who uh, um, you know wants to help you clear up and achieve your dreams. And then we also have Brian Wagner. Uh, who is the manager for uh, Billingsley, a band uh, out of North Carolina. 
and uh, um, he also uh, he also helps uh, the blind and deaf. Um, we had to, uh, we had to watch the scheduling because he has a uh, a class uh, uh, for ta he's taking American Sign Language, um, so uh, should be interesting um, as usual. Oh, we lost your video. Yep, sorry. That's okay. Um, and then oh, now we lost you entirely. Well, uh, and then uh, a week from uh, a week from today will be another episode of YWL Online's Total Anything Can Happen Saturday. Wow, my my brain is going uh, going nuts. Um, and we will be going through. Let me see here. Uh, we'll still be in uh, Dr. Barnett's uh, fifty-two greatest chapters of the Bible. And we'll be talking about Ephesians 6. Oh, spiritual warfare and the armor of God. This is a great one. Uh, very popular. Um, I think we have a, a statue of the armor of God somewhere. Um, at least we did. Um, Leah had it. Had gotten it. Uh, I'll have to see if uh, if I can find it. That's, uh, that's kind of cool. All right. With that, uh, we come to the end of another episode of YWL Online's Anything Can Happen Saturday. Hope you've enjoyed it and uh, gotten plenty out of it. Um, um, and uh, so uh, Rudy's fallen asleep, so I'll say waka 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 with the Lord. And uh, my father's uh, cut off, so uh, I uh, will say blessings from uh, from Poplar Bluff for him, and uh, blessings from Santa Ana, California. Be safe out there, and remember to wash your hands and watch the ending credits. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, this has been a presentation of Bald Spots Productions. I'd like to thank my producer, my beloved mother, Eileen Hatch. I, of course, am your humble host. My co-host is my beloved father, Chaplain Bill Hatch, and my beloved Ed McMahon is Rudy Corlew. If you feel so led, please support the show over on Patreon. You can find us as Bald Spots Pro uh, over there, and we'd love the, we'd love the uh, support. Don't you dare miss Not Quite After Midnight. You can find it on Facebook, on YouTube, and all the major podcasting platforms. Please like, comment, and share to stay informed. You know, subscribe, follow, whatever it is you got to do to kick that algorithm into gear so we can reach more people. Once again, I'd like to thank you all for tuning in and have yourself a wonderful whenever.